Hmm. So we continue today our series for the summer. So I ran into Jesus. Walk by faith, not by sight. By the way, I don't know how many of you have been able to see uh, the new series, Chosen. Um, it's about the disciples. And what I love about that, if, if you haven't seen it with your family, it's an amazing, amazing opportunity to connect. It's an app. You can download it. Look in the App Store or if you have a Google device. It's uh, called Chosen. You can just type Chosen and you will have there. It's a free series. We are in, in season two right now. And we actually watched the last chapter last night as we welcomed the Sabbath. And what I love about that is that the whole series, I've seen many movies about Jesus and the disciples and different series, but I, what I love about this is, is that it, they have made a personal Jesus that has these incredible uh, encounters one-on-one. -on -one. Because I truly believe that Jesus loved to connect with people one-on-one. -on -one. In fact, he would leave crowds just to connect with people one-on-one. -on -one. And today we continue our series, So I Run Into Jesus, and today's message is Walk by Faith, Not by Sight. When you think about someone that had a lot of faith, who comes to mind? Let me hear you. Abraham? Why? Is he, because Abraham is called what? The father of faith, right? The father of nations. So today we're going to get into the Bible and we are going to discover this incredible encounter that Abraham had with Jesus face to face. Did you know that? We're going to discover that today. But before we get into that, I do want to let you know that for some reasons out of our reach, we had to um, postpone our fellowship launch. So we won't have fellowship launch today, but uh, it will be announced when will be our next one. Always love and look forward to that. Um, also want to let you know that on Sabbath, July 18, make plans. We're going to have a youth and Pathfinder fun day at the beach in, in, uh, near, in a park nearby New Smyrna. You can also check our website and you will have more information about that. So make, make plans because we as family have an incredible surprise for that day and we would love for everybody that have kids in those ages to come and join us. We're going to play games at the beach and Miss Alicia is preparing something amazing. It, uh, it's a team effort. Always love uh, those events. Let's get into the word. Let us pray. Father, we open your word because you wrote it for all of us. You had a purpose in mind. You had each one of us in mind when you gave your precious words to the uh, disciples, the apostles, the prophets. And it is our joy to open the word today knowing that you have a special message for each one of us. Let your words be mine today. In Jesus' name we speak and we pray. Amen. So, Abram, his name, Abram. The meaning of Abram is exalted father. So picture this. You meet Abram, you're like, hey, how are you? If I would meet him, my name is Freddie, what's your name? Oh, my name is Abram. Oh, that's a nice name. So what does your name mean? Exalted father. Oh, that's so awesome. Awesome. So how many children do you have? A nun. How old are you? Oh, I'm just 75. Huh. What would you say? I, I would feel sorry for Abram. Imagine that. Let's open our Bibles. Book of Genesis, chapter 12. Book of Genesis, beginnings, chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. And we are going to discover something incredible here. The first point that I want to make today is that we all have been called by God. You and I have been called with a special purpose, with a special mission on earth, and God will not rest until He fulfills His purpose in your life and in my life. So Genesis 12 one says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house 
to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. Promise number one, or blessing number one. I will make you a great, Maria, you said it, a great nation. Blessing or promise number two. It says, I will bless you. Blessing number three, I will make your name great. Blessing number four, and you shall be a blessing. Blessed, blessing number five, I will bless those who bless you. And blessing or promise number six, I will do what? I will curse he or those who try to curse you. And blessing number seven, perfect number, perfection in the Bible. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Can you imagine to receiving seven promises from God? But do you know that if we believe in God by faith, we are all children of Abraham. We are all children of God. And those seven promises given to Abraham are also available for you, to you, and me today. So the Lord wants to tell you, I want you to leave this world. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Leave anything or anyone that will stop you from having a close relationship with me. And if you do that, I promise you that I will bless you. That I will make a great nation of you. You belong to the family of God. It's such a worldwide family. We have so many brothers and sisters. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. Maybe not here on earth. I have a confession to make. I made it to some of you at a podlock. And I will on, be honest with you, when I shared my confession and my dream, they laughed at me. You probably will too. So one of my dreams, yes, Pastor Freddy has crazy dreams. One of my crazy dreams in life, my wife is probably there like, oh no, you're going to say it. It's to be in America's God talent. I knew you were going to laugh. I knew. I knew it. But that's one of my dreams. And we have a saying in Spanish, you know, dream doesn't cost a thing. You can dream all you want. You know, and, and so that's my dream. And I see, but you see, it's different. My dream of, of being in America's Got Talent is not because I want to win the million dollars and have a show in Vegas. I know that will never happen. But I notice that the people that go there and most of the people that advance in the show do it because they have a story to tell. And that's why I love that show, because anyone, regardless of their age, education, social status, cultural background, anyone can participate in that show. But only one can win the big prize. However, many people who haven't won, like one of my favorite uh, uh, acts in the whole show, uh, a little girl at the time, her name was Jackie Evanco. I don't know if you've heard of her. She is an incredible professional now, a classical singer. And she sings beautiful. Like when she sang, people were like, wow. It felt like voices of angels around her. And she didn't want. She got second place. But guess what? She is more famous than whoever won. In fact, I don't even remember the name who won that season, the name of the guy who won that season. But Jackie Evanco is all over the world, famous. So when God says, I will make your name great, he's not talking about fame and popularity. He's talking about a place for you in eternity, a place for you in heaven, where the whole universe will get to know your story of salvation because for the whole all the worlds around the universe, there is nothing more intriguing and exciting than getting to know what will be the end of your life. Our lives are like a big reality show for the universe. And guess what? 
the Apostle Paul in Hebrews says that there are thousands and millions of beings all over the universe rooting for you and me because they want to meet you and me one day in heaven. Isn't that amazing? So the promise of God is not to have fame and popularity here on earth, but have everlasting life and the opportunity that your name will be known in the whole universe, not because of what you do, but because of what Jesus did for you and me on the cross of Calvary. And finally, verse 4 says, So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Uh-oh. Say oh, oh with me. But something happened here, something that was not planned, something that was not part of the script. Lot, his nephew, went with him. Have you ever told your kids something and they didn't do it? Or have you ever told your kids, don't do this, and they just do exactly the opposite? I've realized, uh, uh, grandparents and parents, that sometimes... It's not that our kids don't, don't want to obey. It's that they are, they are so distracted by the things around them that they just didn't pay attention to what we said. So I try to tell them when I, before I get frustrated because they don't do what I want them to do or what I ask them to do. It's like, hijo, you know, son, did you hear what I tell you? Please tell me what I tell you. And most of the time I find out they are like wondering, they're like, what? I, I don't know. So I have to tell him again, this is what I told you. Please, would you please do this? So I picture God. God tells Abraham, leave your family. Leave everything and everyone that you know. I'm going to take you to a special place. Now, some of you that have the heart of a missionary and the heart of helping others probably feel like, but pastor, you know Lot, he was an orphan. His dad... His dad Abraham's older brother died, so Abraham loved him like a, like a son, and, and he wanted to take him. Well, I'm going to show you in the Bible, it will show us that it was never God's plan for Lot to live with Abraham. Because unfortunately, Lot's heart was not Abraham's heart, according to the heart of God. Let's continue with this story. Let's go now to the next passage in our uh, study today. So the first point that I, I want to make today again is, you have been called. God has called you and me with a special purpose here on earth. I love being a youth pastor because I, I get to interact with a lot of young people. And at that age, a lot of people don't know what they're going to do after high school. They don't even know what they want to accomplish in their lives. Sometimes, you know, and, and you get the opportunity of mentoring to them and guiding them through with the gifts and talents that God has given them. But I want to tell you again, regardless who you are, who your parents are, listen, young people, we cannot choose. We did not choose the parents that we got. We did not choose the place where we were born. In this world. We didn't choose the way that we came to this world. But God is giving you and me through his calling. The opportunity to choose the way that we exit this world. Amen. You have been called. You've got mail. Point number two. Do not let anyone or anything distract you, deceive you, or discourage you from the calling that God has given you. Let me tell you, Abram got distracted. He was with his nephew and his wife. And we all know how wives, you know, the Lot's wife ended up, right? Became statue of salt because she loved the world more than she loved God. Simple as that. But something happens. Abram is growing. 
And the Lord is blessing him. And he gets a lot of possession, a lot of cattle. And all of a sudden, Lot, who is always living under his uncle's uh, commodities, and you could call it, he was always, have you ever seen, uh, th there, is, there is a little fish that swims underneath a shark. I don't know if you know the name, anybody, I think it's, the, re, re, what is it? Remora. Remora, thank you, Wally, Remora. It's a little fish that is always swimming, swimming under the shark, and guess what? It's always eating out of the, whatever, the shark, the leftovers. So, so you could say it's like a parasite. It's always getting the benefit while doing nothing. And Lot was reaping the benefits of, of Abraham's promises. Lot wanted the benefits of being close to God. But he didn't want the responsibility or the intimate re relationship with God. So the Bible tells us in our next passage, in Genesis 13 and 14, something incredible that happens. Genesis 13, 14 says, The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him. I found something interesting. At least the Bible doesn't say that God spoke to Abram again until his nephew Lot went on his own way. Wow. Abram offered sacrifices to God. Abram talked to God. But Genesis only tells us that it wasn't until Lot left that God said, okay, Abram, now that we are finally alone, imagine your perfect date. Imagine your first date. Married people and people that are in love here. I mean, married people in love and other people that have not been married yet but are in love. Okay, I don't want to say that when you are married that you're not in love. No, that's not what I meant. Okay, just clear. Imagine your first date. You know what my first date with my wife was? I wanted to make it casual because I didn't want her to think that, you know, it was too serious. So I wanted lunch. But you know, women are always very, very smart, smarter than we are. Guys, we got to admit that, right? She was like, I'm sorry, but, you know, I have such a tight schedule. I'm going to get in trouble when I get home. And <laughs> so I can't, uh, you know, but um, you know what? I, I can't do lunch. How about dinner? And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, we can do dinner. <laughs> so we went to Miami Beach to a very nice uh, coffee place. I, I still remember what I had, not just because I am so in love and I exactly remember. It was that I was so nervous that I bit my tongue while having this fruit salad. So I'll never forget that fruit salad. It was terrible. So I'm like, has that ever happened to you? That you're just eating, having so much of all of a sudden, you're like, mm, and you're like, mm, my goodness, you know? And then you can't let her know, so I'm like, smiling and inside of me I'm like oh my tongue is killing me <laughs> but you know what it is when you are in love to leave everyone and everything just to be with that person because you want to spend quality time with that person and I feel that, that that's exactly what God felt it's like Abraham listen I know that you love your nephew I created him too but he's not into me I want to spend my, I want you to give me your undivided attention because I have great plans for you, but you have been distracted trying to save your nephew. When they separate, Abraham tells his nephew, okay, so listen, you have the whole land, you have your shepherds, I have mine, you have your cattle, I have mine, I don't want us to get into a fight, I love you, choose wherever you want to go, you choose the land. And the Bible says, you can read the whole chapter when you get home, the first verses of chapter 13, that Lot got up, went to the mountain, and saw the valley. Lot saw what it pleased him, what was pleasant to his eyes. And he went to the valley next to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot 
walked by sight. Abram walked by faith. And you know what happened to both? You know the end of their stories? So God tells Abram, I can, I can picture God. He's like, that's my boy. That's my boy. Like when you, one of your children does something amazing or your grandchildren, and you, and you enjoy what they do, that's my boy. So I picture God telling him, come here. You're such a good boy. I'm sorry, I just thought about my dog, Leo, you know, because when he behaves good, I have a golden retriever. I, I just say, who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? And he will sit down, and he, will, he knows that I am pampering him. So I picture God, you know, you know, just so proud of Abraham. And he says, you know what, Abraham? Look around you. Look from where you are to the north, the south, the east, the west. All the land that you see, I will give it to you and to your offspring because you did choose to walk by faith, not by sight. When you put your sight on Jesus, when you look at Jesus before you make any decision on your life, then Jesus will open your eyes and will tell you, look, this is the way that I have for you. Walk in it, and I will bless you. I will protect you. I will guide you. And at the end of the, the road, I will be right there waiting for you with open arms. But Lot, on the other side, decided to set his tent near Sodom. And let me tell you, young people, there is danger when you set your tent near Sodom. And what, that, what do I mean by setting your tent near so Sodom? Well, but what's wrong with it, Dad? There is nothing wrong with it. Everybody does it. Curfew, really? You are so antique. Come on, Dad. Gentlemen, the first tent near Sodom, it's a smile to a lady that it is not your wife. The first tent near Sodom is that she smiles back at you. The first tent at Sodom is like... Yeah, well, I know that that music doesn't really talk about God and has a few bad words, but it's just a song. You're setting your first tent near Sodom. Your first tent. Yeah, let's do this business. You just change the little, the little letters there. Just change them. We will make more money. Nobody will notice. That is setting your first tent near Sodom. You are walking by sight, not by faith. Because those who walk with God will know that it doesn't matter the place. It doesn't matter whether it's the desert in Arizona with no rain or the rainy season in Apopka. Wherever you go, it's not about the place. It's about who is with you. And finally, Lot moves into Sodom. And there is a war. And four kings defeat five kings. It's not about the numbers. It's about strategy. It's about relationships. It's about connections. Those five cities had left God, wanted nothing to do with God. So these other four kings come and defeat them. And Lot and his family are taken as slaves to this other place. Now Abram, wanting to be the good Uncle decides to get his 300 and something servants to go and fight against the, these kings. And he defeats these kings. And he brings back Lot and his family. And if I were Lot, I would have learned my lesson. I would have been like, you know what? Being in this, I, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uncle Abraham, what did God tell you? Tell me more about your God. I want to follow God. No, Lot didn't do that because Lot was so in his comfort zone that he could not see any other place where he could prosper. And it cost him his family, and it cost him everything that he had. 
You see, if you read the passage in Genesis uh, 13, the Bible doesn't say that God told Abram, yes, Abram, go fight and get your nephew back. However, God protected Abram, even though Abram made a decision on his own. And how many times in life we choose to get in the wrong battles? I remember in high school, my kids don't know this story, Alejandro, Edu, don't do this, okay? So I had a good friend, my best friend at the time. His name is Eddie. So Eddie lent some money to some other guy, and this guy didn't pay him back. So Eddie comes to me complaining, oh, Freddie, you know what? My friend, he's not, he doesn't want to pay me. And I'm like, you know, wrong battle, wrong person. You know, nobody told me. I'm like, don't worry, man, I got you. I'm going to get your money back. I ended up in a fight with this guy. He never gave the money back, and we both got suspended. <laughs> really? Choosing your wrong battles. Do not get into battles that you have been called. And the way to avoid fighting the wrong battles is by fixing our eyes in Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So after all of this turmoil, finally, Lot, you know, Abram comes and God finally, after all of those things that happened, trying to save his, his nephew, by the way, you and I are not the saviors. There is only one savior. He already died for the world. It is not your job to try to change, convert, and transform anybody. All we can do is get on our knees and faithfully pray and intercede that God will have mercy on them. But if hanging out with them, whether family, whether friends, that want nothing to do with God, is tearing your relationship with Jesus apart, please, Led them to Jesus. Pray to Jesus. Step away and follow Jesus. So lesson number two. Point number two. What Jesus is telling you and me today is don't let anyone or anything separate you or distract you or discourage you or deceive you from the calling that God has given you. And finally, point number three, and this is my favorite part of the sermon, Genesis 18. Because I discovered something amazing that I had read so many times, and I thought it was in a different circumstances. So Genesis 18, verses 4 through uh, 10 says, Genesis chapter 18, starting in verse 4. I'll give you the context. The Bible starts saying that God appears to Abram, guess where? Under a tree. That's why I told you that the, God's favorite place to meet with humans is under a tree. That's why he created the tree of life. And when, G, uh, when Jesus comes again and finally earth is restored, the tree of life will be the center of a date between God and his children. There is something about trees. I love trees, especially mango trees. <laughs> I'm hungry. I'm almost done, I promise. For those of you who did not have breakfast, we're almost done. So Abram meets three special visitors. Did you know? Well, you know that two of them were angels that later on ended up going to Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? But you know who the third one was? It was Jesus himself. How do we know that? Because the Bible says that the Lord appeared to Abram in person along with two angels. How do we know it was Jesus? Because the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, says that nobody has ever seen the face of God the Father. But Jesus himself, the Son of God, has revealed God's glory to himself. Jesus came to talk to Abram. Now, do you remember how old was Abram when he first 
met God when God first talked to him and promised him that he was going to be a great nation? He was 75 years old. Do you know how old was Abraham? Because now his name has been changed. Imagine this. God is like, okay, Abraham, I'm going to change your name. Your name is not going to be Abraham anymore. Your name now is going to be Abraham. So he goes from being the exalted father with no children, and God tells him, now your name is going to be Abraham, which means father of many multitudes. Can you picture that? So, hey, nice to meet you. What's your name? Oh, well, my name was Abraham. My name now is Abraham. What does that mean? That I am the father of multitudes. How many kids do you have? None. I put it this way. It is like, take for instance, uh, Michael. What, what, how would you feel if I promised you a million dollars? You don't have to go to America's God telling, I promise you. How would you feel if it's great, right? Somebody promises. Now, Michael... 24 years passed by and no, nowhere to find those, not even a penny. How would you feel about my promise to you? 24 years. Some of you would feel sad. Some of you would feel discouraged. Some of you would say, he was lying all, all along. 24 years. Now you know why Abraham is called the father of faith. Because he persevered, even when he had his doubts, even in the times that he tried to help God, and that didn't work out well for him and his family. 24 years after his first promise, Jesus himself says, you know, I think it's been enough, because remember, it's not in your time, it's not in my time, but it is in Jesus' time. Jesus comes and says, Abraham, remember what I promised you 24 years ago? What, Lord, what did you promise? I mean, you made so many promises. I promised you a son. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but let's see how the conversation went. Verse 4. Abraham sees Jesus and the angels, and they come to his place, and, and uh, it, they are outside. Verse 4. Abraham talks to God. Verse 3 says, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on your servant. Verse 4. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet. So the food washing didn't start at the Last Supper. It was a custom where you showed respect for your guests. And Abraham... He's washing the feet of Jesus and the angels. What a privilege. What a privilege that Jesus washed the disciples of Peter and, you know, and uh, the, the, the feet of Peter and his friends. But what a privilege to wash Jesus' feet. And he says, uh, wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. If it was me, I would have offered Jesus uh, corn meals, which in Colombia, arepas, or pizza. I love pizza. Maybe a calzone, Maria. You know, I think Jesus would love a calzone. Um, after that, you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. Verse 6. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, the best meal that you have, and, and get it ready and make cakes. Ooh, it was cakes. Hmm. Let's hurry up. I got to finish. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a tender and good calf and gave it to a young man, and they prepared it. Say, hmm. In order for Jesus and Abraham, in order for God and his servant to sit at the table and have a good meal, someone had to pay the price. Poor calf who was sacrificed and he died. Because the only way in which God and man could be reconciled was by the blood of the Lamb. 
Jesus himself has promised an incredible banquet in heaven. And that banquet will never be canceled, not postponed. Jesus has already set the table for you and me. But in order for you and me to attend that banquet, we need to remember that we need to accept and surrender every day at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you because without your sacrifice, there could be no meal. So he took butter and milk. Ooh. And the calf which they had prepared, and they set it up them, and it was a holy barbecue. And then, verse 9, then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? Mm. So he said, oh, she's somewhere in the tent. Sarah was right there. You know, it was just, you know, do you know some people that are just Sarah? And look at what happened. Verse 10. Jesus knew that she was there. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. Other version says, in one year, I'm going to come back. And what's going to happen? Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Why do you think that Jesus said to Abraham, Sarah, your wife, will have a son? Because the last time, apparently, Jesus was not clear enough. He said, I'm going to give you a son. So Sarah and Abraham tried to help God and said, you know what? God told you that you're going to have children. But he didn't say how. So let's give God a little help because probably God need our, needs our help. Now, does God need our help? And what happened? Here is my servant. And Father Abraham was like, Oh, oh, that's right. So here, you know, Jesus said that he's going to give you a child. He didn't say how, so here is my servant. So this time, what does Jesus say? Just to make it clear for both of you, because I know, Sarah, you're listening over there. You are going to have a child with your wife, Sarah. And by the way, since you think this is funny and you're laughing so much back there, Sarah, who me? No, Lord, no, it wasn't me. Sarah, I know you. Come on. You were laughing. So you're going to name your son Isaac, which means laughter. So every time you call your son, you will remember, never doubt my word because I, I am faithful until the end of the world. Lot, on the other hand, Lost everything. The city was destroyed. Even the angels, and it says, and this is where I tell you, those of you who have children, who have grandchildren, who have family members, who have good friends, best friends from childhood, that want nothing to do with God, or that are not walking according to God's principles, I want to tell you there is hope. Because God, out of the mercy and the prayers, the intercessory prayers of Abraham, spared his nephew's life. And he intended to save his wife and his girls too. But his wife looked back. And I'm so thankful that nowadays God is not as harsh I could feel when we turn our backs and our face away from him. Because I would have been a salt statue a long time ago. But it is by the grace of Jesus, by his sacrifice in the cross, that Jesus tells you and me today, I will fulfill my promises in you. Not because you have been faithful all of your life, but because of my faithfulness to you. Great is thy faithfulness, Amen. O God. Lot lost his wife, lost his possessions, and lost his two daughters to the customs of the pagan nations because he wanted to walk by sight and not by faith. Abraham learned to walk by faith every day of his life. And even though he made a lot of mistakes, he fixed his eyes 
upon Jesus until his character became like the character of God. Do you want to accept God's calling for your life today? Do you want to say, Jesus, forgive me for the many times that I have been distracted, deceived, and discouraged by this world? Would you like to finish with me in point number three by telling Jesus, Jesus, I want to have a, a personal encounter with you, as special and close and intimate as the one that you had with Abraham under that tree. Amen. So every time that you go out and every time that you see a tree, go for a walk. Get under a tree. Except when it's lightning. Get under a tree. Enjoy the shadow of the tree and say this prayer. Open your heart to Jesus. Talk to Jesus like you and him can talk. And tell him, ask him about the plans that he has for you. Because God has called you. Because he is faithful and because he wants to have a personal encounter with you. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for the lessons of today. Thank you because you have been faithful even before the foundation of this world. You continue to call each one of us individually because you want to have a personal relationship with us. Thank you, Lord, because despite our unfaithfulness, despite the times that we get away from you, Lord, we go wandering around, looking around instead of looking at Jesus, you still bring us back to you, Lord. And thank you. Because this encounter one day will be face to face. We want to see you, Lord. Help us to walk by faith, not by sight. So that when all things are said and done, you will give us the privilege to see you face to face. And it is in the name of Jesus and all of your children say, Amen.